Hey, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our uh, holiday edition of Lean Lunch. This is Aaron Eden. I'm the uh, one of the co-founders of Moves the Needle. We're going to have Brent Cooper joining us a little bit later on. Um, just a quick background on Moves the Needle. We help enterprises to transform their culture into one where customer focus, rapid experimentation, and really evidence-based decision making drive continuous innovation in those organizations. Um, we help empower the company to move at the speed of a startup, and our programs really deepen your abilities to go get customer empathy, to accelerate your product pipelines, and really infuse your entire organization with the power and the agility of entrepreneurship. So um, really, to go one level deeper, the purpose of Lean Lunch is to have some in-depth conversations with employees, leaders, and other folks that are applying Lean Startup principles in their enterprises today. Hopefully identify a couple nuggets that you can take away and apply right away in, in your own organization. Um, just give you guys a couple uh, details on some upcoming events we've got. We'll be uh, first week of January, the, the 7th through the 9th, we'll be out in the Denver and Colorado Springs area. So look us up if you're out there. Um, we'll also be hosting a panel at the Frost and Sullivan Innovation Conference in San Diego, January 12th through the 14th. We'll be out doing some client work in the San Francisco area, the 14th through the 16th. So look us up if you're out there. And then off to uh, Finland and some other parts of Europe, the 18th through the 25th. Um, so that's our travel schedule. Um, uh, we'd love to connect with you if you're out in those locations. We always try to help out in the startup community while we're out, or um, you know, f uh, stop in, do a brown bag lunch at your company, whatever the whatever is appropriate. Um, and then, last but not least, on January 30th, uh, we'll have some of the folks from Telus, which is a large telecommunications company up in uh, Canada. They'll be on for lean lunch as well. So. Uh, Enough about moves the needle and, and our schedules. Let's let's dive dive in uh, with our special guest John Motes from uh, from ADP. He's the VP of Product Management and Added Value Services. Um, he's got 14 years of experience with a lot of that time being focused on building and leveraging shared services and platform services and helping to drive uh, simple and elegant customer experiences. Really one of the core principles that he uses to drive success is Lean, um, Lean Startup, uh, all the different variations of it, and uh, helping people uh, do more with less, focusing on the important customer problems, pain points, and and uh, when necessary, saying no to really great ideas to, to drive a focused approach to product development and design. So uh, thank you so much for joining us today, John. No, no great to be here. Great to be here, Aaron. I, uh, I also would, would like to say that you know when uh, John and I worked previously at Intuit um, for a while, and John was actually a mentor to me uh, w when I first became a product manager, and um, you know I know he, he definitely knows his stuff. Uh, my I would I can honestly say that uh, that your help uh, for my career was was huge. So I really appreciate that. You know, Aaron, that's, and that's probably one of the most important things um, is is that mentoring aspect when it comes to driving um, lean and, and driving this type of a change, which is really what this is. And I'm, I'm probably spending a lot of my time, if not most of my time right now, driving this type of change uh, through a large organization. So I think it's, for me, frankly, it's been really interesting to come from an organization like Intuit and, and Intuit, um, I think that's kind of where the lean light bulb went off for me. So mm -hmm. while Aaron talks about me mentoring him, the reality is Aaron sort of mentored me on lean a little bit before I actually got completely um, brainwashed into the into the move, if you will. Um, but it's it was a light bulb for me and into it. So many many years into it, um, doing traditional product management and I, you know, the the road mapping and the the market research and, and all the, the normal practices you would think of um, and then realizing that it's product isn't just research it's uh, it really is and I, I come back to this definition of innovation which I swap with product all the time when I talk about it for me it's about doing something better and doing it a lot better 
um, and doing it so much better that people just forget about how they used to do it. And I really push that with everything I do with, with my organization and my team. And that's one of the things I think I learned probably five or six years ago at Intuit and have applied that pretty rigorously as I've gone forward. So um, it's interesting to take that from Intuit, which is you know what I would call a medium-sized organization, into a very large organization like ADP, where we're 60,000 people um, across many, many countries um, and very dispersed by nature just because of the size of the organization. So it's been, it's been interesting. I bet. <laughs> so, so uh, tell us a little bit about, about your, uh, your journey up to that, you know, up through into it and, and what were you doing before that? So, you know, it's, it's hard to remember. I was at Intuit, I was at Intuit for almost 14 years. So, um, ironically, uh, before Intuit, um, I was in sales um, and I was with large financial institutions in sales and continuing in sales in, uh, in the early stages of Intuit, which is interesting. I actually, I encourage most of my product folks, if not all of them, to um, take a small tour of duty in sales because I think what you learn in sales is critical um, to what we're trying to do now in product, which is identify the problem and focus on the problem. And when you're working in a sales environment where you're, you're trying to find that one thing that's going to win your customer over, it teaches you to ask the questions. It teaches you to probe into the, the problems of the customer and figure out where your, your thing is going to fit into their problem and sell that. Um, so that was it was interesting, an interesting transition uh, from sales into product, and then applying some product principles, and then I think there, Aaron, from there we went. I went into engineering, which was also interesting. Um, sales to product, and then product to engineering, and I learned a lot, a lot about how hard product people can can make lives for the engineers. Um, we never really accounted for, for the engineer's perspective. Um, we didn't really think um, so much about um, developers. And today, which is for me the most interesting part, is developers are now our customers. We're building products now, um, and because code is so open and code is so so much a part of the daily lives of a lot of, a lot of folks, um, you have to think about the developer experience in almost everything you do. So um, I think that particular piece really helped me in the later years at Intuit apply that end-to-end um, -end experience to everything we build. And it's not just the end user. It's the person that supports your product. It's the team that has to maintain it on a daily basis. Thinking about all of those stakeholders as you build is a critical part um, for building a great product, but also moving fast, right? Which is what we all want to do. Um, you can't just leave them on the ground. You can't let them fall through the cracks and think you're going to be successful. You need to move fast, but you need to shape the organization in a way that it can scale and support that movement, or else it's going to fall down eventually. Yeah, <laughs> I, it makes perfect sense. Maybe you can, maybe hey, you Mr. Can Cooper. Hey, sorry, welcome, I'm late. welcome. No worries. Yeah. Glad you're able to fight through your connectivity issues. Yeah. Hey, John. Maybe you could give an example. What do you mean when you uh, you didn't take the engineers into account? What's an what's an example of of what's a scenario where you you felt like they were being they felt like they were being ignored or? You know, I think I think a really simple and even frankly a recent example, Bran, is um, you build an experience and you take your designers and this is this is how. Uh, traditionally, I would do it, call it four or five years ago. Um, you take your product person, you take your visual designer, you take your custom research, and you go build this amazing product. And you throw it over the fence, and you tell your engineers to build it. Um, and in this day and age, you actually have, in a lot of organizations, you have two layers of engineering. You have your team that's actually building that front-end code, um, and then you have your back-end team, because a, a lot of it, if not all of it, anymore service-based. And three months down the road you realize you know APIs can't do that or the data that you thought you had or you think should be easy as a product person doesn't really exist and there's seven months of technical debt that has to be unpacked and repacked to even get to that place where you can display a person's name 
on the user experience because you're trying to get to that humanistic experience that everybody wants and loves and it should be really really easy and you throw that over the fence and then it breaks down and you know going early during the research and not again not just researching with your customer but taking that research and including developers in that research building it in a way that makes it easy for the developer right I mean packaging it in a way so the API's can be clean I I had a conversation with our CFO a few weeks ago and um, we were talking about beautiful API's and we we treat API's like a product because you have to make it as easy and as simple for the engineer to build your experience um, as it is for the user to use it or else you're going to fall down. Um, and that's just a really simple example. And that was a real example where you can't, you have to know, you have to take their perspective uh, into account or else um, it's going to break down and you're going to find yourself in what I call log jams um, that are really, really hard to get out of. So it sounds like the, the resolution to that is is some form of a functional or a cross-functional team is that uh, is that formalized? I mean, have you actually structured uh, with that in mind? But you're certainly talking about a more, you know, hor horizontal uh, way of doing things versus the you know the traditional vertical silos. It, I think it depends. It really depends on the maturity of the organization, the maturity of your product and technology. Um, you know, I can tell you. If you've got a a the backing of an organization where um, you're using consistent technologies, consistent domain models, um, and you are all on the same page and aligned, it makes it a lot easier. When you're working in a large organization, um, that can be harder to do. Uh, and I th I think for me the easiest thing to do, and and I was talking to Aaron about this last week, is you co-locate wherever possible. Um, and for me, co-location is a very, very big part of, of being successful uh, in this kind of this lean, move fast type of a world where you can't have um, your engineers even sitting down the hall. When I think of co-location, I don't think of in the same building. I think of at the same table, and um, that can be hard to do. It's it's ideal. It's it's never possible in all cases that I've ever found. Uh, but you know. We, we just take conference rooms over and we, we, we pile people in the room, we grab the engineers, the architects, the designers, and, and we spend every day together to try to prevent that from happening. I think as you mature, Brant, you can get to a point where um, you have, I think what you described, almost like a governance model um, where um, people can plug in and plug out without having to get 16 meetings on the calendar, which is uh, what happens in a lot of cases. Uh, that takes a very mature organization. Um, it takes some mature technology as well. I think some of the best organizations out there have it, um, but most of them don't, and you have to work through that. Interesting. It's hard. So, it's hard. Yeah. One of the thing. One of the things that you mentioned before, I thought was uh, was interesting in the in 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 your introduction, which was. Uh, kind of that shift from you know moving moving from a, a medium sized company to a much larger company um, and coming in and and uh, trying to help help really drive doing things differently. Uh, what did that What did that look like? <laughs> it, it looked like a very fast train heading towards me on a very fast track. Um, it's you know it's exciting. I there's a couple things I, um, I I've been surprised by to be honest with you. As, one is um, talent. I, you know, coming in a uh, large organization, and I was very fortunate um, where fairly uh, fairly new uh, product organization. So I had um, the benefit of uh, being able to assess talent and assess talent quickly. I had the benefit of having uh, some open, uh, a lot of open spots actually in my organization that I had to fill. Um, and we, interestingly enough, Aaron, we, we applied lean to our hiring and working with the recruiting team, um, we, we did these incredibly fast hiring days where we would bring people in 5, 10, 15 people at a time. We would do almost like speed dating for interviews and then we would make offers same day. Um, it, it was, I mean, we would go through and, and just fill roles as fast as we possibly could. Um, I think what's most interesting to me about that 
and I'd never done that before. Um, your gut response to an individual is generally right. I think the more you think about a candidate, the more you talk yourself into or out of mm. are they the right person. Um, I think the other thing it allows you to do is get creative because you're already kind of breaking the mold of interviewing. So in, in my case, I, I take I take innovation and, and I take um, visioning and designing very, very seriously. And it's a key, key requirement for me. In my case, we actually threw scenarios at the candidates. Um, we, would, we would throw a worst case scenario and how would they react and lead through that. And then we would also throw a design scenario where um, literally I would have them turn around and look at the whiteboard and I would ask them to describe the vision for this whiteboard. Find the biggest problem with this board and explain to me how you're going to create a better board that's going to knock the competition off the, off the rails. And, and generally you know. You can see it in their face when, when they're like, what is this guy? They're, what is going on here? Or they jump right in and then you know. That's the guy I want. They can think on their feet. They can get to a problem as fast as they possibly can. And then they can get right into thinking about why are they the right person to solve this and how are they going to make it better. And again, I go back to my definition better than the, the competition and so much better that they would never go back and use the other board, right? Uh, and it made for some very interesting hiring. But I've, I've been very fortunate. I've, I've filled a lot, of, a lot of my holes very, very quickly. Um, I think it also, it, for me, it was a big learning in that um, from a model perspective uh, and just for some context, my organization, just, just the product side of it is about 52 folks. Um, and I've seeded a lot of new talent, and I think a lot of folks uh, may come in and wonder, you know, how do we drive this change? Do we just start over? Do we rebuild from the ground up? And for me, it was seed, seed new talent with existing talent and let, let folks learn, um, and it seemed to work out pretty well. Uh, people are grasping the concepts. People are getting excited. Um, they're moving faster, and you've got champions that you've inserted into this large organization to drive that change because one person can't do it. Well, that sounds very different from how hiring is done at many large companies. Um, what uh, what sort of organizational issues did you run into uh, trying to do it do this so differently? You know, that's a great question, Aaron. And the typical ones that you're probably already thinking of, um, you need finance to, to actually approve the offer. You need HR to package it up. Um, you you know, if you're relocating, it gets even more complicated. And I have to give a lot of credit to our recruiting team. Um, they literally just brought them all together on a call. We, we brought everybody needed to make the decision together at the end of the day, and we made decisions. Um, all the, I mean, and it went as high as it needed to go to get it approved. And they all came on, and we all made decisions. And we, we talked through every decision. And sometimes those conversations lasted 45 minutes. Sometimes they lasted three hours. But we always got through it, and we were all committed. I think that's the thing that, that makes the most difference, the commitment. From the top down, it was commitment to do it and make it successful and to push through the challenges because we knew we were going to face some of them. Um, but it, it's worked phenomenal, um, phenomenally well. And I think that's, again, I, I, I give a lot of credit to the recruiting team, and I give a lot of credit to the leadership for being committed to the process. Which is important. For me, probably the most important piece of driving this type of change, Aaron, is um, having that commitment from the top down uh, across the board, uh, which I'm, very, again, very fortunate to have that. So when you have that top down support, it makes driving this type of change um, fun. Still hard, but fun. Can you describe some of the, the impact, the tangible results? Yeah, I can. I mean, it's, it's so for sort of context for folks. Um, it's I'm month nine, so I've been been here nine months, um, and at ADP, and um, I would say we've probably put together some of the most compelling uh, product design I've ever done in my career with with the team we have. Um, we went from a single. Uh, UI UX researcher to roughly about 15 uh, in my team right now. Um, we've done more customer research in the last six months than I think uh, the organization probably did in the last six, seven years. Um, and we're applying it. So we're going through releases and iterations every six, six days on a lot of our products now, which we weren't doing before. Uh, we're testing as we go, which we weren't doing before. 
Uh, and what we're getting are phenomenal products, Brent. It's, um, you know, we're still in this cycle, and this is where, um, this is where you get in some of the log jams. You know, we're building great products and great designs. We're, we're still not releasing. Mm. And in a large organization, there's a, there's a lot that goes behind that. And um, trying to get to the place where you can release, uh, you know, at Intuit, I was, in some cases, we released every day almost. Um, but as you get into the larger organizations where you have years and years of process, um, that becomes a lot harder to change. So, um, Plus, you can't go faster than what your customers can handle, right? So uh, depending on different markets, uh, that's going to determine a release cycle as well. It can. Here's, here's something that's interesting. I, I heard that, um, and I've heard that a lot from, from a lot of different places. I think that's changing. And I think what's most interesting for me, and it, it kind of... It happened probably eight weeks ago with me. Um, we were doing some some customer research, and I realized the millennial workforce is having a huge impact on that. Yep. And I, so I'm in the space of building products for companies that manage their employees. So that's what we do, human capital management. And even into it, a lot of what we did was building uh, products and services for small businesses to, to run their business, which is uh, a lot of that with managing their employees as well. These millennials are coming in, and they're demanding faster pace. Uh, the, the employees are are not, you know, they're not going to sit around and wait for software releases. They see things that should be fixed, and they want them fixed tomorrow, not in six months or three months, whatever it might be. And they're kind of seeping into that Generation X and the boomers that are still working, um, and all of a sudden, you've got boomers now raising their arms up. What? Please just change it, fix it. It's got to be better. You have boomers now that are on iPads every day, and they're seeing this very simple, easy-to-use experience, and they come to work, and they're on green screens or something similar, and 57 steps to, to change an address, and they come to Google, and it's a click and a snapshot of their face, and they're done. I think it's going to change a lot, and I, I think the consumerization of that back office experience is moving incredibly fast and incredibly strong because of it. Yeah, no, I agree with that. If you're, if you're building jet engines, however, you know, the, there's the, 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 the delivery cycle to the customer is, is also <laughs> dependent upon on the customer. But, I mean, you've got, you've got a good point. You make a good point. I think it's true. I think that uh, a lot of the businesses that we, that we interact with uh, – you know, it's not even sort of an argument around sustaining versus breakthrough innovation. It's just they recognize the need to have to move faster, and I think it's really determined by, uh, you know, the softwareization of everything inside of companies. Of uh, interactions with their customers are becoming more electronic, obviously. So, and then I, I think you're right. I think that the millennials just growing up with this technology, they're they're already moving faster, and the rest of the world needs to catch up. Yeah, and and even at ADP, I mean, we have um, we have uh, we're driven by mainframes. I mean, and it's it's interesting. There's this stigma around mainframes, and I I was talking to one of my employees last week, and I was like, mainframes aren't bad. Mainframes serve an incredibly important purpose, and when you're paying, you know, one in six people, I think is what we pay. Um, it's got to work, and it's incredibly high volumes. And I don't know that I would ever see a day where we don't have mainframes in our world. Um, the the trick or the secret is understanding where can you peel that or peel that thing back and and simplify it and and allow the teams to work fast around the mainframe versus forcing them into that process around the mainframe, which is going to be to your point around jet engines, right? Um, you're gonna t you're gonna you're gonna test and test and test and test uh, because people's lives are at stake, and while pay isn't necessarily lives. Um, no, it's it's impact, right? It's up there. Yeah, it is. So I'm. I agree. It's. Um, I think it's going to be interesting for at least for me. Um, how do you apply innovation and changing the pace of, of development and change while preserving that stability and that that rock solid uh, mainframe environment that we have to keep? Uh, and we're, you know. We're, we're really starting to think about that, at least my group is right now, and, and how we can do that because we know it's going to be a challenge. Right. So have you infected other groups? Is this a... Uh, <laughs> are, are you starting to see a, 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 an organic spread of, of lean startup ideas? You know, we are... Um, I'll, I'll say this. In, in my organization, um, 
it's just how we roll. Uh, I. I don't have another way to go. I, I don't know another way. I've, I've since forgotten it. And um, I give I give the uh, Aaron and and when I was at Intuit a lot of credit. We it's interesting. We we were thinking about this this age old problem of unstructured time. And it, it, there's two sides. One side it's it's all mythical. It doesn't really happen. And it's it, people just talk about it. It's not real. And the other side is. It does happen. There's just great companies that figure it out. We have to figure it out. And we were one of those companies when I was at Intuit. We were trying to say, why can't we make this work? Because it's not happening in our organization. And we came up with this notion of structuring unstructured time. And we we essentially mandated about 800 folks um, a week a year, spread out three or four sessions over the year. They just unplugged and they got together in small teams. And we followed. Uh, we followed Lean Startup and we, we went after it and we created new ideas, tech innovation, tech exploration, whatever it was, whatever they wanted to work on. Um, ironically, that actually started to turn into the DNA of the teams, which is ultimately what we wanted. Uh, we wouldn't say that too loud because we were trying to take baby steps, but it started to happen and all of a sudden, teams just behave this way every day, which is what you want. Uh, and it's it's interesting because I came to ADP and I was like the second or third day I was here and there was an all hands, and one of the engineers stood up and he just made a comment. How do how are we supposed to compete with these companies that are working in their garage and they don't have the barriers we have at a large organization? And I kind of I kind of laughed and smiled and I like let me let me understand this. You have four guys in their garage with absolutely no funding. They're they're trying to build a product to compete against us, you have 60,000 employees in north of <laughs> billion in revenue and we can't compete? What, what's your blocker? And right. he just kind of looked at me with a smile on his face and I was like, it's about making it part of your every day. It's, you want to innovate? You just do it every day. And that's what we do. And my teams, when we, when we go to build stuff, our roadmap process is, is just what you would expect. It's, it's the lean startup model. We we go do the research. We come up with a hundred different ideas. We put them on a wall, and we pick the one that's the most important. And we solve it, and we solve it incredibly well. That's exactly what we do in every single one of my teams. And it's, you know, it's hit or miss what you would expect. It's you know, some teams are great at it, and more, they're more mature. Some are still learning. Um, but the the what I would call the passion that kind of seeps out of that um, is there. It's it's boiling over in my group, um, and it's it is a little bit to your point, Brand. It's seeping a little bit into the organization, um, and people are starting to hear about it. Um, we're also, I think, the other big big challenge for me is just generally um, culture, um, and you know, trying to create this environment in a in a legacy culture. And um, again, ADP has been incredible. They they've invested a lot in a facility in New York. Um, that they just opened probably four months ago, which is a phenomenal design facility for product development and design. And then we're doing the same out here in California. We're we're looking to uh, finalize the location and get that done in 2015. So uh, we're going to build the culture and the facilities around this this um, mindset that we're creating within the teams, which is great. It's a really important part of it. Expecting teams to behave like this and then putting them in cubes scattered around the building just doesn't work. Yeah, I think that uh, there's only a handful of companies that have reached that point where they they're actively, you know, transforming the culture, uh, and like you've mentioned, that that that's the part of it that definitely has to come from top down. Uh, uh, but it doesn't happen without teams like yours on the grassroots level uh, pushing up. You have to have it going in both directions, or or it doesn't work. So uh, yeah, it sounds interesting. In both directions, and um, I would I would just stress um, it's the hardest thing you'll ever do. Um, it really is. It's um, I I I tell my team, and I've told everybody I've hired, it's going to be the hardest, funnest eighteen to twenty four months of your life um, trying to drive this type of change because um, you know it's it's a massive organization, and it's not. Um, when you get into large organizations and you know take ADP out of it, any large organization, uh, they're successful. 
<laughs> so if you're at the crisis stage in a company, it's too late, and and it doesn't matter, frankly. But you're talking about large organizations where they have a track record of success. They have year-over-year -year growth. They're they're meeting their margins. They're meeting their NOI revenue. You know, it's not you know it's not growing at the pace of some of these startups, but you know, we don't have a, a fifteen million dollar end game. You know, the end, end game's in tens of billions, right? And you're trying to drive change in organizations that are incredibly successful. Yep. That's always harder. Uh, and you're always going to get resistance. And frankly, a lot of it is is the right resistance in the sense that you have to be more thoughtful. You have to really understand impacts a lot deeper than you would in a in a startup or a much smaller organization because it has a a trickle down effect across the organization. So um, it is difficult, um, and you take pockets. And, and again, my 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 way of doing things is I just I cut off what I call thin slices, and I just take slice by slice and and slowly chip away um, and drive that change through chipping um, versus what I would call the nuclear approach. I don't think the nuclear approach ever works very well. Um, right. But you know, chip. Chip, chip, and eventually it it'll start to change. And I, and I think we saw the same thing at Intuit. Frankly, um, it took years to drive that the type of change that you see at Intuit today, which is a much different company than it was four years ago. Yeah, we definitely we we like to say it's a, a long journey. There's no doubt about it. So that there's actually not even that many examples in uh, in human history where companies consciously are going through a massive technological transformation where they have to transform culture inside their company. I mean, it seems like it seems like even a pretty crazy question to ask uh, ask an organization to do. Yeah, no, and and again, it's you pick pockets and um, and you you try to make the pockets great, and uh, and then you pick up your next pocket, and um, you know, at the end of the day, even you know, ten percent. If you hit ten percent of those those swings. You're gonna, you're gonna know, uh, no pun intended. You're gonna move the needle for the organization, and that's what we want to do. So, um, but it's, it's hard. It's challenging. I think it starts with talent, um, all the way through the ranks, having the right talent that knows how to, to drive the change, um, and then just continually reinforcing and supporting that uh, with the organization, celebrating the wins, celebrating the, the failures, which is uh, hard for large organizations to do sometimes, but I, I think it's really important. That's a really good, uh, really good one to dig into. So, what are some what are some ways that you've uh, been able to help help uh, celebrate some failures uh, in in your history? <laughs> that's 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 a <laughs> there's too many there's too many to count. It's you know it, there's it's about the learning. It's what did we learn? Um, and um, I, I gave an example earlier where you know. We just we didn't include the right people, and um, what do you do from that? Do you just do it again, <laughs> or do you change the structure? Do you put the put processes or um, practices in place to prevent it from happening, and then celebrate that? It's you know, do you if you build a bad product, I you know I, I tell my folks all the time, I don't care if you build a bad product, just recognize when it's bad. As, I mean, I don't pretend to know the answer to all the product solutions. That's what that's what research and testing is for. And but if you test it and it fails, don't talk yourself into the the research was bad or the customers were unique or admit that you missed it and then figure out what you learned out of it. There's always a learning. I I, I remember going through this with teams and you, you go do the research and they come back deflated. They failed like the. the 30%, only 30% actually understood what we were even trying to do here. What are we going to do? And I, I kind of, I kind of smile. It's like, well, what did their actions tell you to do? Um, and that's when it becomes a positive experience versus this negative experience. And for me, that's that's everything. You do a release and it and it bottoms out on you. Well, what did you learn? Something. You learned there were holes in our process. You learned there were holes holes in the support chain. You learned that there was a system we didn't even know existed around the corner. Whatever it was, let's pick it up and and make that the the flag, if you will, for for championing the next release and championing the next thing we do. So, um, I don't spend a lot of time, frankly, focusing on the bad. 
I, I really try to move past it very, very quickly. Um, and, you know, uh, in a lar- again, a large organization, there's a lot of diligence. There's a lot of, a lot of folks that want to have that detailed look back. And, um, you know, I, I generally let, let them do the looking back and, and get my team focused on moving forward, um, which, uh, again, can be hard for some folks to swallow. Um, but I think it's the right thing to do. I think you hit on something really important there, which is which is the role of leadership with teams that are behaving this way, right? Um, being able to to help the teams uh, see what they've learned through that process and and get through that that low point um, and ensure that they learn from it, um, I think is is uh, often oftentimes missed um, in that you know there's a transition from from being a manager to being a, a mentor, right? Um, yes. And and not just not just poking the team to say, okay, get out and do it again, but really helping them pause long enough to figure out what they learned from it. It's the hard. It's the I'll tell you, it's been the hardest part um, of of working in a, in the larger organization is um, finding the role for the managers and the leaders. Um, in in my simple world, and I really I live in a simple world. I have a small team, and they they're empowered and they make decisions. I have a level right there above them, and their job is to really help with some of the strategy and the visioning, and and um, really think of you know two years out. And then there's my level, and our job is to just sit back and watch success. But <laughs> if, if things go off the rails is to coach. It's not to, it's not to be directive. And I really try to, to move away from that directive type of leadership into a, an empowering mentoring type of leadership. That is incredibly difficult, particularly with, uh, when you have, um, managers that are used to managing and directing and making decisions and pulling that out of that role, um, and getting to a place where the, the managers and the leaders can be comfortable just empowering teams, uh, is hard. Um, it's really that, hard. To do. That really comes back to people too, right? I mean, there's, there's, frankly, there's going to be some people that just maybe can't get out of that manager mindset, um, and there's other people that you, you can sort of know that they're going to get it. They need some help getting there, but, but uh, it's worth the investment. It is. It is. Um, what's interesting, I, I, I come back to, you kind of know. Um, you you pull you pull this out uh, this this model out and you put it into the organization and you can very quickly see who's comfortable or uncomfortable um, and I like the uncomfortableness because it makes things obvious um, and as a leader as, as you're trying to drive this type of change for me the number one thing you should be doing is sitting back and looking for that uncomfortableness in all your employees and your leaders seeing who's adjusting to it seeing who's asking for help and I I, one of the things I, I really rely on is that, is who, I don't care if you don't know how to do it. It's all new for a lot of people. This is, I mean, frankly, lean, lean is new for a lot of people. Um, it's uncomfortable for a lot of people. I'm okay with that. I want that person knocking on my door every day. I'll take the knock on the door every day. If they want to get coach, mentor, get advice, it's the folks that don't knock on the door uh, that is where I get concerned. Um, I see the uncomfortableness. I see that I see that they're a little lost and they're not sure what to do. Um, and they can go two paths. Let me go get coached and mentored, or let me go try to do it the old way. And it become again, it becomes very obvious um, in the organization when you have that where it is, and then you have to deal with that. And there's there's all kinds of ways to deal with that. But at the end of the day, you have to, um, because no matter how fast the teams are, that core team in the middle. Um, and how well they're embracing it. And I've never, by the way, I've never found a core team that doesn't want to do this. You know, they, they're not used to it, uh, but when they actually know what this is and they learn it and they understand what lean is and they understand that they can actually move fast, they understand that they can be empowered to make decisions, I've never found a team that does not want to do that. Um, it generally happens at that, that mid-level manager level where they're uncomfortable um, and they they have the log jams that float in there um, I don't think it's bad intent, Brant. I just think it's because that's how they do it. Um, and they're uncomfortable, and they don't know their role or responsibility in this model. And frankly, learning for me is being better about that, is, is being very clear and and thinking of that stakeholder in the model uh, when you're driving change. A lot of times you think of, 
above and you think of down deep below um, and you miss the group in the middle, uh, which was probably a pretty, it was a very big learning for me um, to, to make sure that you're accounting for, for that group um, and really defining that role. Cool. So what, uh, you got any tips for, for the audience? Uh, they need, they're, they're, they're planning to go talk to their senior leadership to try to get them on board with some of this stuff. What was, uh, so was, that understood, was that understood when you joined, or was that a, 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 a question that you brought up, or how did that work for you, and what would be a tip for somebody? How do they, how do they start that process? Again, I'm sure it's taking small slices off, but you have to start moving that, uh, you have to start moving that leadership at some point. You do. I, so here, I, that's a great question, and um, it's interesting. So there was, um, there's this, there's this notion, uh, and I talk about support from the top. There was, a, you know, there's a move to, to agile and a move to the frameworks. And I, I'm always really clear with folks. Agile is a framework and a, and a kind of a rail you put the card on, but you have to define the card and you have to define the plan. And you have to, agile doesn't solve your problem, and. But what I've found generally works, um, and I think it's it's worked uh, here at ADP with me, is just very tangible examples. Um, and knowing the audience, you know, I, I talk very differently to my team versus the, the president and the, the executive team, right? Um, but I, I think it was examples, and and they can apply those examples. And if you go in, if you go in with this, detailed spreadsheet. A lot of people just think executives want spreadsheets and costs and they want to know the value and the return on investment, which they de they definitely do. They all want to know that. We all want to know. I want to know that. I mean, I you know, at the end of the day, I'm here to make money. Um, I, that's what we're here to do. At the On the other side of that, though, when you're talking about organizational structure and you're talking about this type of a change, um, they really want to understand where have you seen this before, and why? Why is this right for us right now? Um, and I went in with examples, and I, I gave some really simple examples, um, and and I think the one that I resonated the most with folks was I brought up the shipping container, and and I was I don't know if you know the story behind the shipping container. The shipping container is a really interesting story. I, I think the the guy that invented it um, actually invented it in 1926. I think it actually went to production in 1956, if I'm, if I'm quoting these dates right. Um, he was a shiploader, and he you know, backs his truck up. People carry the stuff into the boat. It takes weeks to do this, and all of a sudden, the goods are bad. They ship them, and it, it's, you know, it, was, it was what it was. Everybody did it that way. Everybody did it that way. He came up with a metal box and, and literally took 30 years to get it to production, because technology wasn't there, process, manufacturing wasn't there, all these things that had to kind of add up to get to that point. But when it went to production, it took shipping costs from like $6 a ton to, to 19 cents. It drew, I mean, it changed the world. And by the way, it's still there. It's a big metal box. It hasn't changed a lot, right? So when I think of, of ADP, we have this big mainframe. And we've been doing it like this for 30 plus years. And my question is, are, are, we, are we in that metal box point? Are, are we to the point where technology has caught up, our customers have caught up, the market has caught up, and we need to change? Are we there? And, in, and they're doing just what you were doing, at least a, a few of them nodding their heads, right? And, right? and all of a sudden, it makes sense. And wow, we have an opportunity. And the secret to getting people bought off on this is, get them connected to the opportunity and get them to believe you can do more with less and get them to believe you can move every few weeks, not every few months. Get them to believe it's our time. It's, it, this is our time in our organization to do this and here's why. That's, that seems to work. Um, and sometimes people, it may not be the right time, but I think in our case it is. Do people feel the momentum outside their, their doors like, uh, maybe not competition, maybe competition, but maybe even just other businesses. Do they do they get a sense that other companies are are uh, are trying to tackle this as well? Uh, I mean, does that create part of the feeling that this is maybe the right time? It does. I mean, that's definitely a part of it. It's um, 
you know, when you think about some of the startups in, in our space in human capital management, uh, some of these companies popped up in weeks. It took a significant share of market. I mean, significant meaning whole percentages, right? One percent right. for a startup is pretty significant in our space. So, um, yeah, that that opens eyes. I think there's also a much there's a much broader awareness um, with your your top five consultants. Um, and so you can imagine large organizations, they're going to they're gonna use those top five consultants a lot uh, for almost everything they do. Um, and I've seen just, uh, just in being here in, in nine months, um, the consultants out there are very dialed into this. Um, they use the language, they're talking about it a lot. Um, you know, it's, it's making, I think it's making the executives kind of scratch their head a little bit and think about this now for the first time. It's not just... Um, the buzzword out of Palo Alto. Uh, it is real because the top five are talking about it. Uh, I think that's a big part of it. Um, I think the other thing is, and I've seen this in some of the, the market research on executives, if you if you look at some of the top questions the, um, the executives are asking when they're looking at, at providers for services and software, um, they want to know what's your technical roadmap and plan. They want, to, they want to understand how fast you're going to be changing your technology year over year, month over month. Um, and they're starting to ask those questions. And it's, it's becoming much harder uh, for organizations, large organizations, to answer that question. Um, and so they're trying to wrap their plans around that because they want a better answer because people care about it now. Do you actually use the term uh, lean startup? What are the terms that are bounced around there? Do you guys use something different? Uh, we use lean. We use lean. I, I use yep. um, I use lean start and lean startup. Um, we have even um, we've. I think the, the the group here has done a phenomenal job. Before I before I joined, um, they adopted um, this lean six sigma for process and business process improvement, which uh, is a big part of the culture uh, here at ADP. So um, lean is very very uh, known and understood within our organization. Uh, and it's it's becoming attached to a lot, um, you know. Obviously, I'm on the product side, um, but it's not a foreign language for us at this point. The the organization understands it. Interesting. So, have you had a uh, any examples of you having a uh, uh, an uncomfortable conversation around these sort of things with maybe a uh, an internal functional group, compliance or legal or branding or that you actually had to work through? It's all, there. there's, I think generally as you change and drive this type of change, um, it's pretty uncomfortable all the time. And I, I think that's just a reality. Um, I don't know what I would do if it was comfortable, to be honest with you. I, I kind of like that uncomfortableness. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's uh, there's easy examples where you just say no. Um, I mean, you 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 have a sales force that that is um, like any sales force, right? Sales forces are feature driven. Um, they want features to sell, um, and you know, saying no um, to features and focusing on smaller things that are more important and more meaningful is an uncomfortable conversation a lot. Um, not just with sales, but with, with even my team. You know, um, product people really like to go build stuff. Um, and, you know, I'm trying to say, no, no, don't build a bunch of stuff. Build the one one thing um, that's going to change and, and, again, move the needle for us. I want the one thing. I don't want 15 things. Um, the roadmap conversations generally, um, you know, again, you can take ADP out of this. I think in general, those are hard conversations um, all the time because, you want to, I'm going to force, I'm going to force it down. I'm going to force it down to that smallest thing. Um, and, you know, if I see an Excel sizing on, on the spreadsheet, it gets pushed back. Those are hard conversations. Um, I think talent's probably the hardest conversation, Brant. Um, you know, having those conversations with people, um, good people, really good people, just not, um, it's not in their DNA to, to, to drive, drive stuff like this. Um, and lean is not for everyone. I mean, it's, you're, you're in this, you know this, right? It's, it takes a certain type of someone to do this, and those are hard conversations because there's, um, there's just, it's different. 
it's different and uh, it's not for everyone. It's probably the hardest conversation uh, I've, I've had. And again, take ADP out of it. I'm just coming to the realization that this isn't going to work for someone in their career. Um, but you have to have those conversations or else they struggle, the team struggles, and it just doesn't work. I, uh, I wanted to ask uh, for you personally, um, you know, where, where, do you, uh, where do you look to, to shift your thinking? Um, are there are there individuals that influence you or specific? I have you my hang mentors. Out? I have my mentors. Um, I I read a lot. I read a lot. Uh, whenever whenever someone asks, I always, what you, what's the best thing I can do? I read read as much as you possibly can. Um, there's so much good information out there. Um, so many people that are learning on a daily basis and publishing on a daily basis, which you never had before. Um, I I bring up it's it's interesting I I I uh, on the leadership mentoring group here at ADP and um, I present to um, I present it out to our our high performing or next leader group and I talk about mentoring and I put up a list of books that I've recently read and at the top of that list is Sammy Hagar's uh, book Red and you know everybody kind of what are you talking to Sammy Hagar uh, I like if you've ever read this book you would you would understand. This is a guy who people put basis. It's a rock star, right? It's a rock star, likes to drive Ferraris. Is Van Halen lead singer. What you don't know about him is he owned the largest fire protection company in Southern California. He sold his tequila business for I think north of a hundred million dollars. Um, he's probably one of the smartest businessmen in in my generation for sure. Um, and his life story was amazing. How he learned through his life and through the years with Van Halen into the business side of the world. You can't get that out of you know, no no offense to some of the other traditional business books. You just don't get those experiences. Um, but that's where I go. I I, I absolutely and then the, my kids. I if you your kids aren't old enough yet, Aaron, but to watch my nine year old. I mean, even yesterday, right? We Christmas and um, it's amazing. She I mean, she made a she made a full on movie um, with her friend yesterday and published it and played it on. On Apple TV for us at dinner last night. I'm like, whoa! Um, creating programs on scratch. Um, I mean, you learn so much from the young generation. Um, that's where you have to go. And then locally here in LA, we have a lot of the meetups. I, I think you probably know about meetups. Um, you got to go to meetups as much as you possibly can. Um, there's, it just changes too fast. I mean, that's that's what I tell people every day. It changes so fast. If if you're not doing that, it's going to pass you by. It's just going to pass you by. All right, folks. So I didn't I didn't see that one coming, but your uh, your lean uh, startup book for the enterprise is Sammy Hagar's <laughs> Red. <laughs> nice. Have you read it? I have to ask. Have you read it? I have not read it. I have to read it. Just not be a book that I would even pause and look at on the shelf. So. <laughs> I heard the awesome. uh, I, he I heard the 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 red M and M story and the details as to where where that came from. I've just heard <laughs> that story, but not the rest of them. So that is a great story. I love it. Good, good. Well, definitely. Uh, you know, I always like to like to dig into some of those details and and make sure that folks understand that you know the we try to we put on this program for exactly that reason, right? Which is to hopefully get get out some details that'll that'll help folks as they're going through this in their in their journey in their company. Um, but you know, there, as you stated very very clearly, there are lots of different places to to get that, and and things are moving quickly. So you've got to be on top of it. Um, so uh, any uh, any any final closing thoughts that you have um, for for other leaders that uh, that are looking to uh, you know, push this through their organization. Any other, any other last nuggets you want to make sure to share? You know, probably just a, a little bit of re a recap or repeat. Is um, as leaders, um, y you have to drive it. You you have to stand up um, and take accountability. I think that's that's key. Is be accountable as a leader, and and everyone's a leader. That's the other thing I would say. The notion that you know the VP is leading this or the manager is leading this. Everybody needs to lead this, and if you can actually instill that that concept of you're a leader um, into every employee, it's going to be a lot more successful. Um, and I think just trust. I you know 
you gotta you gotta trust that you you're gonna be successful. Believe that you may move slower first to move faster later, um, but don't lose sight of the fact that you're doing the right thing. And as you walk through those challenges and those struggles, and you you see things start to to slow down a little bit, just keep pushing. Too many people just stop and go back to the way it was. And they're not willing to take the hit and and honestly, you know, skip a release cycle. Don't deliver something in an effort to get to the right end result over the long and medium term. And if you can do that, you're going to be successful. If you stop and, and start to rethink things because it slows down a little bit, um, you're not. And I can promise you it's going to slow down. Um, it, it always slows down before it gets fast. I experienced that at Intuit. I'm experiencing here at ADP. It will get slower before it gets faster, but you got to push through that or else you're, you're not going to get there. Oh, left myself muted too long. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, th thank you for that, and uh, thank you very much for joining us today and, and sharing your insights as you're, you know, in the middle of this uh, long and tough journey. So no, this is great. Uh, I'd love to come back in another, you know, nine months and, and see where we're at. I, you know, <laughs> that'd be nice. I would expect it to be a lot different, so I'd love to do that. Senior product manager John Motes joins us. For <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny, Aaron. <laughs> All right, guys, thanks a lot. Thank you, thanks John. So much, John. Appreciate it, and talk to you soon.